Hey, fellow traveler. Let's say that you are about to take a mid to late summer car trip. All right, you've done this. You are a person who knows the great state of Ohio, and uh, you're about to take a car trip, though. You're headed to, uh, let's say, the Carolinas for uh, a meetup of somebody or your own family vacation. How do you know if you're on 77, let's say, and you're driving south, you're trying to get to the, to the Carolinas if you ever made that drive, how do you know when you've crossed over from Ohio into a new state, probably West Virginia, maybe Kentucky or whatever, how do you know that you've crossed over? How do you know that the boundary has occurred? Pretty simple, right? It is the Ohio River, this, this great river that you've had to go up onto um, a bridge to cross and it gets your attention, right? This is a clear boundary. And if you've ever traveled north into Ohio, south out of Ohio, you know what boundary I'm talking about, right? But let's say, fellow traveler, that your trip is a little different. You're not headed to the Carolinas, you're not headed south, you're headed west out of Ohio. You have that bucket list trip, and it's this car trip of some national parks and, and to see some of the great expanse of our beautiful, beautiful nation and you're traveling west out of Ohio, how do you know where the boundary is there? Well, don't blink, right? You need to make sure you see the sign for it. There's a clear sign, to, usually on most you know, interstates or roads or whatever, um, but it's possible that if you didn't see that sign, that you wouldn't know you've crossed the boundary. Also, you know, uh, you wouldn't know that it actually is in the right place unless the sign is trusted, right? And so unless we know that the sign is accurate, we wouldn't know if we actually crossed it 100 feet before or after or whatever. The Ohio River, such a clear boundary. Into Indiana, for example, from this great state of Ohio, still a boundary, uh, but not quite as discernible or as felt, right? So I'm thinking with you this morning about how we know how boundaries work and how God works uh, with boundaries and uh, that's really the sort of theme uh, for our reflection for the next few minutes together. Good morning, good afternoon, welcome to Preparing for Sunday where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday's gospel, usually gospel, but scripture lectionary text. This is for the 10th week after Pentecost, year B? See, I ask it as a question because year B is the Mark year, and Mark's the shortest gospel, and so in Mark we often get these John interlocutions, and this week we're getting the first of five weeks of a John interlocution, and it is uh, John chapter 6 for the next five weeks interrupting our normal Mark and broadcast. And so uh, I'm going to talk to you about boundaries. That's sort of the theme. And I can come at that theme from a few different angles as we let ourselves be prepared by the Holy Spirit for our worship gathering uh, this Sunday. The first way I'll talk about boundaries, uh, from Mark into John. We're crossing a boundary there. And that one's maybe closer to like uh, the Ohio River type boundary. I mean, that's a clear boundary, a clear difference. If you're been in church and you've heard us work our way into Mark and now we're jumping over to John, you know something's happened. It's a pretty clear difference. Mark is the earthy gospel. We get an earthy human Jesus telling earthy human uh, stories. He's doing a lot of miracles. There's a lot of touching uh, of Jesus to heal people. In John, we get a Jesus who is very philosophical, talks more than, than performs, um, who wants to teach, and what he teaches is pretty philosophical, or in this way, I guess I'll say theological. So we've jumped a pretty clear boundary. There are all sorts of boundaries in our lives. Personal boundaries, a boundary that you don't cross, a boundary that sometimes it's time for you to cross. And so now we're playing with this idea of the boundary between Mark and John, the boundary between where God begins and ends, and where my life or the life of others around us begins and ends. And who owns this boundary, and how does it work? 
John is going to tell us that Jesus is the boundary breaker, that we aren't really able to do this ourselves, but that uh, Jesus breaks into what we think is our own little little bubble of broken weirdness, and uh, Jesus breaks into it for the purpose of redeeming it. And so John tells that story a little differently. If you remember Mark, if you've been following along in Mark, you know that Mark loved contrasts. We're now over the boundary, but we're talking about Mark. We're into John, but we're talking about that thing back there. Mark loves contrasts. He sets two banquets next to each other. The banquet of Herod, where uh, Salome dances, and um, where John the Baptist's head ends up on a platter. It's by invitation only. It's got power and uh, politics going on. And then the second banquet is the Jesus feeding of the multitudes. And it is powerless in some ways. It's not about how much power you have. It's not by invite. Uh, it's open. It's public. Um, the bread here is, is a very simple, earthy kind of bread. But what it's talking about is, in John, um, this inbreaking of Jesus into what we thought was just our realm. Uh, you know, Mark wants to compare and contrast two kinds of banquets, so you can sort of decide, hey, which one do I want to be? John is much more about telling us who Jesus is. Last week, we were in the sixth chapter of Mark, and we lost a big segment. It was cut out of the lectionary, and that was the feeding of the multitude. It was cut out because the lectionary knew that it was going to give us five weeks in John chapter 6 to get a really more in-depth look at that banquet. It cut it out so that we didn't get six weeks in a row, so that we only got five. And now we're crossing that boundary, uh, or, or, or the lectionary is crossing that boundary, I guess, uh, taking us from Mark to John. The feeding of the multitude is an important miracle in the Gospels. Uh, to me, it's not uh, you know the pinnacle of all the miracles, that, but uh, important, a lot to teach. Um, it isn't the most flabbergasting of the miracles, although it's up there, right? Um, but what makes the feeding of the multitude important scripturally and lectionary-wise is that it is the only miracle unless you're talking about the resurrection, which is its own miracle, it is the only miracle of Jesus that is uh, present in all four Gospels. The reason why the lectionary can cut out that feeding of the multitude in Mark and jump to John is because it's the same miracle present in both stories. That's what bridges the boundary here. Um, not, this is the only miracle in all four Gospels. Matthew and Mark actually have two multitude feedings. John has just this one, it's in the sixth chapter, and then in a very Johannine, uh, John way, Jesus is going to riff on the bread. I'm the bread of life. He's going to do all sorts of this boundary breaking, uh, bringing the philosophy, the theology, the, the, the kingdom of God right into the midst of everyday life. And so, um, uh, you get this uh, miracle that's in all four of the Gospels, but John, and really only John, can tell it in this, uh, in this way. Um, one of the things you have to do here to, to understand where we're at with God at work, with boundaries, with how the boundaries are being broken and why, you kind of have to understand uh, the, the, the relationship of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the synoptic Gospels, to John. John is the, the odd gospel, it's different. The synoptics have the sin, same view, optics, same view. Uh, John has a different one. And so you, to think through the relationship of that, you start to understand what we're talking about with this boundary thing. And um, the way to sort of enter into that is to say, hey, uh, why don't you flip in your Bible? Why don't you give this a pause and flip in your Bible to the upper room last supper in the gospel of John? Um, you know, the Last Supper is important to you and I as Lutherans because we have two sacraments. We have baptism and communion, and we practice communion weekly because of the boundary God breaks into our world in this bread. Jesus is no longer ascended into, only ascended into heaven, but is also Jesus present in this bread. 
and um, uh, we get that and all the words we say at the communion table uh, from the Gospels. Um, you know, the practice of it, uh, and that happened in the upper room. And so if you want to, you can pause and you can find the story of the upper room in John, and you can find where the, the Eucharist is instituted. If you'd pause this, you're, you might have never come back. Uh, if you didn't pause this, uh, good job, because it doesn't exist in John. There is no institution of the Lord's Supper in John. Instead, the sacraments, the boundary for them, is not an upper room where the institution and the disciples who are this select group are pulled apart and it started. The boundary of the sacraments is that they're buried right into the story itself. The sacraments of, of um, communion is maybe best fit into John. He theologizes the feeding of the multitude and makes it into a visible sign of God's presence in our world, breaking the boundary, and he makes the communion talk that the other Gospels put in the upper room present at the multitude, and then thereby makes it theologized. It's not just a story, but now it is a theology and an institutional practice, and it's sacramental. And so that's the boundary you cross over from John to Mark. Mark would never really theologize a thing, whereas John would always theologize a thing. And what you get here is no upper room in John. Well, why? How come communion so important? Well, because John explains that for five weeks of lectionary readings in the sixth chapter of John, where it's integral, where the boundary of where God is and how God works is in front of us, not in an upper room. The boundaries here are being played with. Think of some of the words of the institution of the Last Supper. These are all present in the synoptic gospels. Take, break, give thanks, distribute. Jesus says those things in the upper room. Jesus says all those things in the feeding of the multitude in John. The institutional boundary, like, hey, I got to go to church to get to communion, is, is broken here, where it's this thing that it, we don't go to church to do it. God comes to us to do it. And that's an important sort of boundary-breaking idea of what communion is and how communion works. Um, I have attached to the email for this link two sort of documents where you can look at sacramentalism in John. That's a debated thing. Uh, scholars debate that. I come down on the side of it. It's definitely present. Um, I've attached two documents to support that if you want to read further. Um, but what we're going to get then, because I believe in the sacrament of John here, is this feeding of the multitude, this living in the world as people who follow this banquet as opposed to Herod's banquet in Markan terms. In John terms, it's this... Uh, sort of, uh, how do you know God is present? God teaches us this in the sacrament. And uh, so you're going to get five weeks of sort of a mini confirmation where Jesus is the bread of life, and you're going to get a lot of what we believe in confirmation embedded, a lot of bread analogies, uh, but you're going to get a lot of how God explains to us who God is, because that's what John is all about. The boundaries here are going to be blurred on, are we talking about bread or are we talking about Jesus? That's the sacrament. Is, is the loaf bread or is it Jesus? Yes. The boundary between its, its breadness or its Jesusness are, are washed away, and it is both, right? So we have um, here this story of uh, the feeding of the multitude. When you get it in John, it's sacramentalized. It's really the only one where you can preach heavily sacraments. Maybe then the synoptics, when this comes up, it's about more like our pantry. Uh, when it comes up in John, it's more like why we have the sacraments. Um, uh, by making that move, by John having the same multitude feeding as all the other Gospels have, but sacramentalizing it, taking the upper room and embedding that into this story, what we get is that this meal is more than a remembrance, and that's a very Lutheran identity thing. 
This is not a remembrance. Like, oh, remember by eating this bread and drinking this grape juice that Jesus one time uh, talked and taught in an upper room. It's not about remembering Jesus and our abilities. It's about the boundary of Jesus being moved to now envelop us. If God lives in God's kingdom and we live here, what this is telling us is, is that there, that enveloping of what is God's kingdom is moved. And this is not a remembrance. It is an act. By making it the feeding of the 5,000 sacramental, it means that it can't just be a pretty theology, which as Lutherans I think we have a pretty theology, which I will talk about for five whole weeks in church. This is a big confirmation segment you know, here for these five weeks. But it's also about actual act of God and what it means to partake in this meal and what God is doing in, in the world. And that that story, that visible sign, it should be more important to us than the story of all the other stuff that we see and involve ourselves in. Are we people who see this as God's kingdom, or do we see this as an election cycle? Well, it's sort of both, but it's always God's kingdom, and it's always a boundary-breaking God at work, and we are along for the ride. And that is faithful instead of fearful, right? So, you know, we talk here about how our communion table is open. The theology of why communion tables are open is very Johannine and very much from the sixth chapter of John. In the upper room, Jesus has a group that he's taught for quite a while, and he's brought them apart and brought them into a room and then communed them. That's much more like, hey, you got to be confirmed before you have communion. In John, the feeding of the multitude is open. 5,000 people who he hasn't taught, he hasn't gotten repentance, there hasn't been, but he's just offering this and it's sacramental, means that the table's open. Uh, we as Lutherans believe this. This is why I've named our meal open table, which we eat bread at it a lot, but it's not all the way communion, but you know, it's, it's the sharing that story. Lots of churches uh, will, will disagree with uh, the theology of communion. Um, there are a few denominations, Salvation Army, Quakers, who don't commune at all, basically. And they won't commune at all because they say, hey, we're, we're, we, we as Christians fight over this too much. It's not even worth it. It's just a story. Let's not. Uh, whereas as Lutherans, we commune every week because that's where God reclaims us and where we're reminded that it's not about our ability to find the boundary or keep the boundary or, or, or do well with, with boundaries, but it, God will always love us no matter where we're at in relationship to the boundaries. This is good news because we like to think all boundaries are the Ohio River and clear, whereas most of the boundaries into sinfulness and bad decisions and everything else are way more vague. And that means that if we aren't careful, we're on the wrong side of the boundary and don't even know it. John's telling us it doesn't matter. God's power is big enough to enter into any of the states, boundary or no, right? So I'm going to give you a little example of what I'm talking about here, just tiny of how complicated all this is. In chapter 6, verses 67 through 71, which we will get in a few weeks as part of this uh interlocution of John chapter 6. It's the only appearance of the disciples altogether in John. We don't get a calling of the disciples in John. Most of what Jesus does in John is to everybody. The boundary is not as discernible in John because Jesus is not concerned with what state we're in. Are you an Indianan? Uh, Jesus loves you. Are you an Ohioan? Jesus loves you. Are you a Kentuckian? Jesus loves you. Even a West Virginian. Uh, Jesus loves you at all. You know, I can keep going on. Um, whereas Mark with the upper room, Matthew, Luke with the upper room, with disciples who have been taught, it's a little bit more there about, hey, get taught, repent, and you'll, you'll deserve this. John has nothing to do with that. Uh, and, and it's really important then that if you see John 6 as sacramental, that you hear how Lutheran, the way I'm talking about this is. This is confirmation stuff, and we all need reminded of it. The sermon for the coming weeks is going to be about bread. It's going to 
be in John 6. And I'll give you a personal little thing here. I don't like this in year B when we get John chapter 6 for five weeks. By like the third, especially the fourth and fifth weeks of it, I feel like it's the same sermon over and over again. There is no way to understand the boundary of how communion works. How is bread, fully bread, fully Jesus at the same time, as Lutherans talk about it? Where does it stop? Where does it end? When does it become Jesus? When does it become bread? These are all things we're going to wrestle with and I'm going to reteach or re-talk about in the coming weeks. Um, but what we get here is a five-week communion refresher because I am the bread of life makes Jesus sacramentalizing of our lives very real and very present. Um, you are a part of God's kingdom by virtue of being called by the Holy Spirit and partaking in the meal that we believe is Jesus' real presence. And it becomes Jesus' presence in us and then it becomes the way the Holy Spirit works through us in our world, nourished by this sacrament. So in the coming weeks, I'm going to wrestle with how to have enough preparing for Sunday stuff to talk about. I'm going to unpack again and again a lot of what I've talked about. If you feel like, hey, I don't understand all that, you're welcome to keep listening. We'll try this video again. You can read the attachments. But I'm also going to be unpacking this for four more preparings and for four more weeks of sermons. Um, and uh, really, it's a, 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 I don't know, it's a sort of confirmation class because we have crossed over the boundary of Mark and into John. And once we're into John, we're asked to think about um, where God's holiness can break. What's the limit to it into our lives? What's the limit of, of the boundaries we make? And the Johannine answer is, because God can feed any who come, there is no limit to God's love. And to be loved is to be moved into the kingdom of God, into heaven, and into abundant life. And God does this, and uh, we reflect on it this week with our study of John chapter 6. And honestly, for the next few weeks, our series for these five weeks of John 6 will be called Bread and Belief. We'll talk a lot about bread. I hope you like it. But we'll really be talking about what communion is and what a visible sign is. We're going to talk about this sign that is Jesus. It's communion. It's a clear sign that the boundary of brokenness is out there. It's not here. And when we gather, God saves us. Our world is not broken. It is God's work, and you and I are a part of it. This is a great time to reflect on that, and uh, it's a great time to hear again the gospel and to be reminded again of what it means to be Lutheran and to believe what we believe about communion. And all of that happens when we jump from Mark to John chapter 6 uh, this upcoming week. If you do intend to travel, stay safe. Uh, either way, I hope you tune in digitally. Or even better yet, I hope to see you uh, uh, up close and personal in the flesh. Uh, and uh, I hope that you stay safe. And uh, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon.